So in the last video, we looked at a simple magnifying glass like this one. But in this video, we're going to take it to the next invention that arose from a magnifying glass, and that is the compound microscope. Now the compound microscope came out of early, uh, six, early, late 16th, early 17th century Holland, so early 1600s, late 1500s, and it seemed to arise in the spectacle making trade there. Now we don't exactly know who invented the microscope. Um, the name that's commonly associated with it is a Zacharias Jensen, um, but the claim that he invented it was not made by him, but rather his son after he died. And the claim was that he invented it in 1590, but various sources on the web at least seem to suggest that he was born in about 1580 to 1585, making him about five or 10 years old at the time he was supposed to have invented it. So there's perhaps some reason to doubt the veracity of those accounts. The other name associated with it is Hans Lippershe, who again was in a spectacle maker in, uh, the Ho in Holland around the same time. Um, and in fact, even Galileo Galilei's name is sometimes associated with the invention of the microscope. But in reality, we don't know who invented it. Um, and the reason for that is that the spectacle making trade at the time was just developing new techniques to make um, large, high quality lenses viable. And so there was a lot of secrecy surrounding how uh, individual uh, people made large, high quality lenses because they didn't want others to copy them. And so uh, as a result, we don't actually know who came up with the compound microscope. However, whoever did come up with the idea noticed that when you took two magnifying glasses like this and put them at either end of a short tube, what you ended up with was a device that had a magnification power much greater than either of the lenses individually was capable of managing. And that gave us access to a microscopic realm that we had never seen before. So to understand how a simple compound microscope works, let's have a look at some detail um, and do some calculations on the magnification factor. So here's our ray diagram of a simple compound microscope. And as you can see, the compound microscope consists of two lenses. At the bottom here, we have a converging lens that is close to the object. And so this is called the objective lens. And at the top here, we have the, another converging lens that's close to the eye, and so this is called the eyepiece lens. And the distance between them here is shown as a distance L, and this is essentially sort of the length of the tube, if you like, that's mounting the two lenses, one at the top and one at the bottom. Now, if we look in detail at how this works, what happens is the lower objective lens that's near the object that creates a real and magnified image of uh, the object here. So you can see that we're getting a real image uh, formed here. And that real image then acts as the object for the eyepiece lens. And the eyepiece lens then acts as a magnifying glass, producing a magnified version of this already magnified image. And so we can get a magnification from the objective lens, and we get a second magnification from the eyepiece lens. And the overall magnification factor for the microscope is then the magnification of the objective times the magnification for the eyepiece. Now, we've already calculated the magnification factor for the eyepiece because we know it's acting exactly like a magnifying glass. So we can already write this out as the magnification of the objective multiplied by d over fe, where this is the focal length of the eyepiece, plus 1. Right. So we already know the magnification factor for the um, for the eyepiece lens because it's just a magnifying glass. So the question is now, what is the magnification for the objective? Well, the magnification for the objective lens is going to be minus V over U. So what we've got here is we've got V, and of course this is V for the objective and U for the objective. So um, what do we have for these values? Well, what we want is we want um, V here to be as large as possible. 
And to get V to be as large as possible, that means, because we've still got the lens equation applying, so 1 over U um, plus 1 over V is equal to 1 over F. So what this means is that if V becomes very, very large, so as V goes to uh, a large value, then 1 over V will become small, and that means that U will have to become roughly equal to F. Right, So u will tend to go to f as v goes to a very large number. And typically what we find for these lenses here, the lenses that work best here are ones that have a very short focal length. Um, so you place the object very, very close to the lens because these uh, objective lenses typically will have a very, very short uh, focal length. So when we do that, if, um, if we're placing this very, very close to the focal point, then this image is going to be as far away uh, from this lens as, as we can make it. Well, of course, the limit on this is it still has to fit inside the tube here. So we can't have, uh, so V is going to be roughly equal to L, the length of the tube. It can't be longer than the length of the tube. Otherwise, this eyepiece will not act as a magnifying glass. And so, the approximation we make here is that V is going to be approximately equal to the tube length and U is going to be approximately equal to the focal length of the objective lens. And so our magnification factor now for the objective lens is equal to minus and then we've got L divided by um, F. Uh, o. So L is the length of the tube, essentially the length of the, the microscope, and FO is the focal length of the objective lens. And so we put that all together and we get a magnification factor that's equal to minus L over FO times D over FE plus 1. And so that's how a mag that's the magnification factor for our compound or simple compound uh, microscope. And so we can see that what we get here is because we've got a minus sign here, it's going to be an inverted image. However, it is still a virtual image because the second lens is essentially magnifying the real inverted image produced by the first lens. And when you produce a virtual image, it's the same way round as whatever you start with for your object. So we start uh, with an inverted image for the object and then we magnify it and we maintain the same inversion. So overall, we have a final image that's both virtual and inverted. So this is another example where a multiple uh, lens system is not limited by the, the usual rules that apply to single lens systems, where obviously with a single lens, if it's a virtual image, it's the right way up. Here, because we've got two lenses, we're having a virtual image that's inverted. But you can see as well how we can get a magnification from both lenses. And so that's how we multiply up and end up with a net magnification factor that's a lot higher than what either lens is capable of. So as we've just seen, we can now calculate the magnification power of a microscope. And we can see that a simple device made from two of these magnifying glass lenses, two converging lenses, ends up with an overall magnification that is significantly higher than either of the lenses individually. Now, in 1665, our old friend Robert Hooke, who was famous, of course, for Hooke's Law for Springs, uh, used a microscope to publish an international best-selling book called Micrographia. And all that that book contained was drawings, because of course there were no cameras back then, but simply drawings of things he saw through his microscope. And one of the discoveries that he made was that all biological organisms were made up of cells. And you can see one of the pictures from his book where he looked at uh, uh, some cork, where you can see the sort of the wall of plant cells that make up the cork material. Now, it was Leeuwenhoek in the um, Netherlands who took it one step further shortly after uh, Robert Hooke. He used his microscope to study, or well, in fact, to, to discover bacteria and protozoa, and so founded the field of microbiology, which of course gave us our foundation for all of modern medicine. So clearly, the microscope was an incredibly revolutionary device, and it's still used for medicine today. Um, 
This is in fact the microscope that belonged to my dad when he was a medical stu student at the University of Leeds in Yorkshire back in 1955. And even an old microscope like this uh, with a suitable light source, because of course when you magnify something you end up um, only looking at a very small area and so you need a very intense light source to be able to see um, something through the microscope. But even an old microscope like this, you can easily see um, plant cells through it. This has got a sample of fern underneath it and you can see the individual cells in the, in the fern's structure. Now, this microscope, of course, is a little bit uh, more complicated than just two simple converging lenses. It has replaceable eyepieces and replaceable objective lenses. And the eyepiece, although it contains a converging lens, it's actually a sequence of lenses. And those extra lenses are there to correct for all the different types of aberration, or at least some of the different types of aberration, such as spherical aberration and chromatic aberration, so that you can actually see um, clearly through the microscope. And this, of course, was what limited the resolving power, the, the magnification power of early microscopes, was the inability to make these uh, complicated, high-quality lens systems. Now, Today's microscope has really sort of more or less re reached the limits of what's possible with uh, optical uh, microscopes. And so that's why if we want to go smaller than uh, what you can reach with an optical microscope, we go now into electron microscopes. Um, and there's two sort of basic types of electron microscopes. There's one that use an electron um, similarly or, or reasonably similarly to how it's used in a, a photons are used in an optical microscope um, but because the electrons uh, have a shorter wavelength they can probe you, we can see things with a with a small on a smaller distance scale than is possible with uh, visible light going beyond that we actually now have uh, scanning uh, tunneling electron microscopes and these are ones that use a very 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 fine needle and uh, we use quantum mechanical tunneling of electrons from the needle to the sample and that is incredibly sensitive to the distance between the needle and the sample and so you scan the needle over the material and those can achieve a resolution of individual atoms. Going further though, the field I work in, particle physics, you can actually in some ways describe some of our big accelerators as essentially incredibly um, powerful uh, microscopes. And the reason for that is, is that if you collide particles together, they probe the physics that's going on at incredibly small distance scales. Now obviously they're not like this sort of microscope where you create a picture of something because what you're doing then is you're trying to study the structure of a scale about a thousand times smaller than an individual proton or neutron in a nucleus. And so at that point, you can't really have, I mean, the, the concept of a sort of visible picture of what's going on is rather difficult because it's a very, very much a realm governed by relativistic quantum mechanics. And so you can't generate a sort of a picture, as it were, of a proton. It's a mathematical picture rather than a, um, you know, a photo album type picture. But that's where microscopes have led us to. We can now study the microscopic realm and it revolutionized and continues to revolutionize our understanding of the universe around us. However, optical instruments were not just limited to looking at very, very small scale. The other application that also you can produce from two converging lenses like this is a telescope. And the next video, we're going to discuss how to build a simple astronomical telescope, and we'll discuss the implications of that invention and how we've used it to revolutionize our understanding of where we are in the universe. Thank you.